the name of God, creating, redeeming, and sanctifying. Amen. Do any of you have certain special things that you keep stored away? Maybe even wrapped in tissue paper or a special box or bag because it's so precious to you that you want to protect it. This seems to be a human tendency to hide away what we value the most and keep it in a safe place. For some of us, this may be a set of china that we got as wedding presents or an heirloom handed down by a great grandmother or grandfather. For others, it might be a precious diary or a few old photos. Whether we are poor or wealthy or in between, it seems that we all want to hold on to something that has special value for us, and we protect it by hiding it somewhere safe, whether that's a personal bank vault, a special closet shelf or a bureau drawer behind some socks maybe, or just in the back of a worn out wallet or the band of a hat we never take off. My mother had a beautiful set of bone china and silver flatware that were her wedding gifts. She had the china closed up in a built-in cabinet in the corner of our dining room, where it could be seen stacked carefully behind glass doors, and the silver was in faded green felt bags beneath the cupboard. These things came out with great ceremony about twice a year at Christmas and Thanksgiving, and maybe occasionally for another special occasion. Otherwise, every morning, noon, and night, we ate off decades-old Melmac plates. Does anybody remember Melmac? <laughs> There's no question that by sequestering these things, they took on a very special status when they were used. But most of the time, they lay dormant, unused. And still, somehow, a few of the teacups got stained and cracked, and Small chips appeared on a few of the plates. They were beautiful, but they were treated like specimens in a museum. When my husband and I got married, we promised ourselves that whatever we had, however beautiful or humble, we would take it all out regularly and use it. Now, I don't suppose we regularly eat pizza off fine china, but yes, we bring out the good stuff regularly for guests who are known to be both, both neat and sloppy, children, the aged, and the infirm. There have been a few casualties across three decades of use, but really not that many. And we basically take the chips and cracks in stride, reminding ourselves that people and the time we spend together are more important than things. This is how I read today's gospel with Jesus' famous sayings about salt and light. Like the precious things we may all have stored away, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. A lamp is no good if it's shut away in a closet. Are there ways in which you secret your own talents? hide your gifts or fail to use them? What would help you be bolder in bringing what sparkles in you out into the world more fully than you already do? And what about that saying, you are salt? This is a bit confusing for the scientists among us, especially since in reality, salt is actually a very stable chemical compound that can't lose its flavor. But various historians have suggested that the so-called salt that people would have been familiar with in Jesus' time, gathered mostly from the Dead Sea, was actually a mixture of salt and dust that could easily be contaminated with sand and other substances and become tasteless dust. And even good salt can lose its flavor when it is diluted in too much liquid. So if you and I are the salt of the earth, as Jesus first declares, then in one sense, we can never lose our flavor. We are always good for something. 
Our saltiness is our goodness, our zest for life, our worth, the spiritual gifts we have received, of which Paul speaks in today's epistle. Jesus is warning that we not allow these gifts to be dulled or diluted or tarnished by worthless things. What is Jesus really referring to as salt and light in this passage? Matthew provides the definition by stating Jesus' definition as righteousness, as in the context in the verses that follow. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which was Jesus' shorthand for the pious, whom Jesus saw as hypocrites, who could talk the talk but not walk the walk of love and justice and mercy. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the pious, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You are salt because you have zest to bring to the world. You are light because your good works bring light to the obscure and hidden places of suffering. The framers of our lectionary put this gospel reading together with the reading from the prophet Isaiah, which we also will hear on Ash Wednesday, to hammer home what Jesus understood as the true meaning of the Jewish law not to indulge in pious rituals while still engaging in activities that oppress other people. But is not this the fast that I choose, says the prophet Isaiah, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? when you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light, your light, shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. There's that light again that must not be hidden away. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If re you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light, there it is again, shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. One last caveat. These words of consolation in Isaiah do not mean that you will be perfectly safe. You wouldn't need a rear guard and you wouldn't need to cry for help, as the prophet says, if you were already perfectly safe. I don't know where this quote comes from, but I like it. What would you do if you weren't afraid? What would you do if you weren't afraid? Are we afraid of being chipped or cracked or broken the way my mother was afraid for her china? Maybe so. But Jesus calls us to a radical fearlessness that isn't always about being safe and protected, but about really being out there and doing what we believe is right. Maybe you could be safer, like my mother's china, if you stayed hidden in a closet all the time. Maybe your little candle flame would be safer if you cupped it in your hand or hid it under a bushel. But even my mother's china took on wear and tear with the years. And sometimes a candle will flicker or even go out when the wind blows too hard. But at the end of your life and my life, what would, be, what would we be rather willing to say? That we never got a dent or scratch? That we always had a bright light within it, 
in us, but no one saw it because we kept it in a cave? It's not easy, but I would hope that at least sometimes, in some places, we would be brave and put ourselves out there in the fight for freedom, truth, and justice when we see the need close in front of us. I would hope that at least sometimes, in some places, we would be willing to risk being banged around a little for the sake of the love and justice of the gospel. When we see hate or untruth or signs of unjust misery and oppression in our midst, where will we be and what will we do? And I believe with all my heart, even when I'm too scared to fully practice this myself, that the wounds we suffer from putting our saltiness out into the world and letting our light shine bright and true are also treasures that can be the measures of our lives. Those wounds can be treasures. There is a Japanese art called kintsugi, which means golden repair. Maybe some of you have heard of this. When a ceramic pot becomes broken, these artists do not try to cover up the cracks with some kind of camouflage glaze, as if the cracks didn't exist. But instead, they fill the cracks with a lacquer dust mi mixed with gold or other precious metal. And the pots become even more valuable because of the uniqueness and the refinement of their scars. Their scars are gold. Or maybe thinking of the song Anthem by Leonard Cohen, we just leave our cracks open for all the world to see. They become a part of who we are. They are our battle wounds, our sources of wisdom, and signs of our fearlessness and determination to fight for the good. Leonard Cohen sang, I can't run no more with that lawless crowd while the killers in high places say their prayers out loud. But they've summoned, they've summoned up a thundercloud and they're going to hear from me. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. You can add up the parts, you won't have the sum. You can strike up the march, there is no drum. Every heart, every heart to love will come, but like a refugee. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So today, show off your salty zest. Let your light so shine before other people that they may see your good works and give glory to God. Oh, and don't worry about the chips and cracks. They may be your most precious treasure. Amen.